Okay, everybody. Hello and welcome to the Building Alliances section of the Edible Cities Network Conference. Um, I think you've all had a lovely sort of day and a half so far. There's been lots of great conversations going on. Um, and so we're coming into the final session, which is all about building alliances. Um, my name is Vic and I work for the Brighton Hove Food Partnership. We're one of the NGOs in the um, partnership and we um, are based in Brighton Hove, which is a city on the south coast of England. Um, we've been doing community food work for about, oh, I don't know, started in 2006 um, and run a range of gardens. We also do food cooking projects, um, but also we work with like policymakers at a local level and are part of national alliances. So this is something I really believe in as a kind of topic and a session. Um, Hopefully most of you have actually um, been at the conference the last few days and so are well ahead of how all of this is working, but we are using the question and answer sessions section of Zoom for the questions. So that is where they will be um, posted by the people listening and you can upvote them if you think it's a really good question. Um, and I will put those all to the people on the panel at the end when we have the open discussion. If the question is kind of factual, so it's just like, I don't know, how many people are involved, then the panelists can actually just answer as we go along, but we'll save anything discussion based to the end. Um, I'm also going to remind you all that the conference is being recorded um, and that we also have the illustrator who is drawing what we say as we go along. And I was just looking at that screen as we came in. It um, is a really lovely depiction of an event. Um, I also wanted to just um, mention that if there are any unanswered questions, so if you are absolutely burning with loads of questions and we get to the end, we will actually be able to follow up with some emails and information afterwards. So we've got a lot of panelists and they're gonna be speaking on all sorts of different levels. So we have people who are talking at a really, really hyper-local level in terms of alliances, at a city level, at a national level and at an international level. So there's gonna be lots to draw on and pull together. Um, but personally, I believe that alliances are all about connections as individuals. They're about what we do when we work with and engage with somebody else who either has something they want to do similar to us or actually can help us in some way or just wants to come along for the pleasure and the enjoyment. And so as I introduce each of our speakers, I'm not actually going to let read out their biogs because actually you've got that. I ask them all something that's a bit personal, something that would actually help you to meet them as a person, which is what is their favorite food scent? And so we're gonna put these out to everybody and feel free to add into the chat if you wanna throw yours in as well. And so my first person is Ninka and uh, her, her favorite scent is summer rain. So I'm going to hand over now and ask her to speak to us about her work in Rotterdam um, on kind of what they are doing around building alliances. So thank you very much. Great, thank you uh, very much Vic for the introduction. We, are, we started in, uh, in Rotterdam with Groen um, 010, you can see it in my name, as a, a coalition of, of different grassroots initiatives. And um, actually before Edible Cities Network came around, we already knew each other, found each other and um, yeah, worked together. We were already kind of connected. So in two, 2017, we started to join forces and um, um, yeah, later on the Edison Net project came along. So it was really a perfect project for us to embark on and to um, make a next step and also to, um, to share the learned lessons and also to learn from others in, in this, um, uh, how do you say it, in this connecting, in this building alliances. Um, we, we were already starting a municipal uh, lobby for a green office, which was successful before Edible Cities uh, Network came along. And we organized a green election debate for the local elections of Rotterdam in 2018. And actually all of the um, parties came along and that's quite a, I think we had 12 or 15 different parties because it's a huge coalition here in Rotterdam. So, so um, we like to make a, to build coalitions. Uh, this is our, our board. Uh, some of us are also joining in uh, as panelists today. So we have Paul, Rutger, Mireille, Caroline, Max and me. Um, yeah, it's a nice coalition to work in. 
Our main goal um, of our Living Lab, our, our Rotterdam initiative, is setting up a worldwide network of green, initi green initiatives, edible, non-edible, green initiatives uh, as a larger uh, idea to ensure the continuity of these initiatives in the city, the, the ECSs, as we talk about uh, here. And we organize many uh, get-togethers um, where people get to say um, what they think, what they need, um, yeah, to ensure this continuity. Um, we consist of many different, um, I won't, I won't uh, uh, tell you, yeah, you can read by yourself everything that's in the screen, but we consist of many different uh, existing uh, green and edible green initiatives throughout the city. And we have a lot of experience among us, more than 10 years, some people almost 20 years uh, have been working outdoors in the, in the green edible environment. Um, we also produced a report within the Living Lab in the Edible Cities Network uh, towards a Rotterdam network of green food initiatives. It does a self-reflective research and um, out of this research came four action perspectives and we actually made different groups throughout the, the, the initiatives that, uh, that, that exist in Rotterdam, not only us as board members but, but uh, wider and we are working on four different action perspectives uh, as we speak. Um, all uh, working towards um, sustaining the green initiatives in the city. So these are the four action perspectives uh, that we made. We now formed four working groups. So one is about lobbying and representing shared interests. The other is about sharing knowledge, skills and stuff, you know, things that you need. Um, another one is making the value and the message of Edible City Solutions visible. And the last uh, one is making, thinking about an overarching collaboration. We are already united in Groen 010, but we are continuously thinking about, is this the best form? Uh, how do we organize ourselves? Uh, do we need sub-organizations, et cetera? Um, one of your questions before, we, before I was to do this presentation was, what would you do if you were to start again? And, and actually we thought about it and, and many things, of course, but, but uh, the most important one was to get different stakeholders involved at an earlier stage, because uh, we um, first we looked for um, each other, you know, other initiatives, which is really nice and which works really well. And I think we do have a strong network already. Um, but if we were to start again and we knew this would be coming, I think we would have um, found different stakeholders at an earlier stage to work with. Um, the current board um, exists of a network of initiatives, as I already said. Um, it's a really wide net network from mushroom growers to rooftop farmers. We have beekeepers, neighborhood gardeners, and yeah, collective herb gardeners. It's really a wide variety of initiatives that we have in Rotterdam. And all of them, they work in the green, they have their own a local network. So actually we're a coalition of networks and, and all of these networks are also about um, improving health and your social environment. And this morning I was just in another um, uh, session talking about all the health benefits that we, that we get from working in the green. Um, yeah, and, and it's good that we are strong because we, we make coalitions of the net existing networks that makes us strong. Um, so we do collaborate with all different uh, networks that exist, not local networks, but also larger citywide networks uh, in Rotterdam. Um, we like in Edible Cities Network to collaborate, but also to learn from other cities. Like last uh, annual meeting in September, we visited Berlin and we also took a chance to visit Princess Garden, which is really nice. And you hear uh, many um, uh, things that you recognize, eh? um, and it's also good to learn the, the things that you don't recognize. It's, it's um, interesting to learn from other cities what they do. So that's also something we help. We we hope that the SITNET will help us in achieving our goals, and and our main goal is of course sustaining the green initiatives. Um, yeah, and we hope to learn also today from you guys and from the other cities that we will find in the future. Um, how to sustain ourselves and how to become a, a larger green edible network. Yeah, so this is where you can find us. And um, 
yeah, I wonder if you recognize things that I've said or maybe you have questions, let me know. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction to all the things that are going on in Rotterdam. It makes you think that you could have a whole meal around your network. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I uh, haven't seen any um, clarification questions in the Q&A at the moment, so I will encourage people to put those in at the moment. But I'll actually keep us going with our presentations because I think some of the questions that will come up will actually come up being for everybody. So. We're moving to Berlin next, and we're going to go and see uh, Kirsten, whose uh, favourite scent is a freshly harvested tomato. And I think that one of the things that I would say is that is one of those smells that the minute it gets put into plastic and, you know, completely and utterly disappears. So I can completely emphasise with it and uh, bring on summer. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction and hello to everybody. Uh, you hear me good. Just give me a very good. Um, well, five minutes for 20 years of garden network in Berlin. Let's go. Um, first, I just want to tell you I'm, I'm working. My job is in urban development, but I'm, but I'm here as an urban gardening activist. And this is really about 20 years of experience about it. And I, I, I think there are a lot of similarities of what you just uh, told about Rotterdam. I, think, uh, I mean, I share a lot of things you said. Um, just to give you a first a little bit an impression about uh, the gardens, um, there are between 150 or 200 community gardens in Berlin. It depends a little bit um, what you include in this term community garden. The first ones they started who would call themselves community garden, they started in 2000. And most of them were really bottom up grassroots initi initiatives. So in these gardens, you had already a bunch of activists from different fields, climate change activists, food enthusiasts. Uh, they were squatting vacant lots in the garden or they were just uh, in, in, the, in the city or they were just neighborhood initiatives. So 10 years later, I would say it was more and more starting that community gardens were more and more developed by um, city programs with support of, for example, the socially integrated city program in Berlin and also developed by agencies. So we have a little bit an issue of top down, bottom up garden. I don't judge about it, but it's an issue. Um, um, from the beginning, the network, the gardening network uh, was first very much about exchange of uh, knowledge, exchange of experience in the garden, and just meeting, you know, and this was very often supported by a foundation that is very important for community gardening in the whole country Germany is the Anstiftung. They very much support networking, exchange, sharing knowledge and things like this. I just share a super short presentation um, with you, a diversity of the networks that uh, appeared in this time. Um, so, but there is a, a very important change uh, during the years because in the beginning, it was kind of soft networking exchange of knowledge, as I said, but with the rapid change of the city, gentrification processes, privatization processes, a lot of, um, building construction uh, projects, the main reason for networking for community gardens was more and more political. It was really a lot of gardens were threatened more or less suddenly. Uh, these spots that were kind of outdoor centers, uh, community centers in the neighborhoods were threatened. And this was especially important in very dense inner city areas. So, um, in this time, the Garten, uh, the Garten Aktivistin Treffen uh, and uh, the Almende Contour, which is also a garden, but it started as the idea of a network to work together. Uh, they were built as political gardening networks, really fighting together against the growing threat of gardens uh, in the city. But then later, <laughs> um, you have also, since 100 years, a huge number of allotment gardens in Berlin. And, you know, it, there is a lot of prejudices going on, you know, these ones are the super conservative ones with the little garden dwarfs, and the urban gardening uh, gardens are a little bit like anarchist. 
but I have to tell you, I mean, there are more than 70,000 allotment gardens in Berlin. It's huge. And to make it short, some of these activists in both types of gardens, they fell a little bit in love with each other and they understood we have a lot of common issues because more and more also allotment gardens are facing um, to be threatened and to disappear after uh, many, many years. So we came together and we built the Forum Stadtgärtnern, which you find here, which is really a network of allotment garden activists and urban garden activists, which is quite something, I must say. And this Forum Stadtgärtnern doesn't understand itself as, you know, just talking about gardens. It's really a little bit like in Rotterdam, uh, a green, green initiative network. It's about urban green. It's about protection and permanent protection, saving urban green that is so, so crucial for environmental justice in the city, for biodiversity, health, and climate. But we want to talk about food, I understood. So uh, I don't want to highlight so much urban gardens, which include the allotment gardens, as spaces for production. I want to mention other aspects I think that are super important. Um, and all this is happening mainly self-organized. This is very important to mention for me. Community gardens um, invite each other for, wood, for workshops about foods. They learn a lot about compost. They learn about preparing foods. They share the harvest, they share recipes, but um, they cook together and they eat together. And this is a very social important aspect. But also these places very often are contribution spots for community supported actual, uh, agriculture initiatives. So they spread this idea also about regional cooperation or even European ones. There is, for example, going on a lot of cooperation with Sicily. Um, then there are political supporters in the community gardens and in the network of the movement La Via Campesina, Campesina or food sharing initiatives. Uh, very often these gardens cooperate with kindergartens and school and there they learn and they teach a lot about healthy food. They show that the carrots are not growing in the supermarket and this is extremely important, especially in neighborhoods um, with some social issues and a, a really a lack of green space. And last but certainly not least, I think gardens are, the, are hosting two of the most important ambassadors of edible city solutions, I think. And you know who I'm talking about. It's the bees and the worms. I think one of the most interesting and growing network activity in Berlin community gardens is about worms and compost. And I think really compost is one of the biggest potentials when we talk about edible city solutions and the importance of community gardening. And I think we should maybe address this also because these are spots that could be much more used as community compost areas. And I know there are some uh, examples, for example, in uh, Paris who do this. Um, but I also said in the beginning, vice versa, what can Edible City do to support these networks uh, of gardens? I mean, first, it's the recognition that these gardens, as small as they are, but there are many, are really important spaces for edible city concepts. And I think it's very much about recognition and also respect that these are initiative activists that don't have the capacities always on daytime or whenever to join uh, collaborations, for example, to create a master plan. So, and also I think what is very important to have people in administration as a contact uh, for this initiative, that it's very easy and clear to reach people who can help. Of course, also programs and concepts help this initiative. But first of all, we have to put an end to threaten these gardens. We have to give them a permanent or a long-term protection as green spaces, as spaces for climate, as food spaces in the city, and we have together to find really solution, uh, especially when it's about competition with social infrastructure, which I find really absurd. I must say that there is this competition. We have to find solution like multifunctional use uh, in the city. And my last word, uh, 
is there are some uh, topics maybe we can discuss it later uh, some keywords here in this uh, chart what we need to do and i think the first thing we all within the garden within the garden networks and within intersectoral cooperation is to define what are we talking about and what is our common vision because very often i experience in the beginning you think we all want the same which is not exactly true <laughs> And, um, and also to use our different ways of action. It's clear the administration cannot change themselves at the tree to protect it, but we as activists, we can. So I'm very excited to hear how we can collaborate more creative and more respectful also towards different capacities. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, and before I move on out of the kind of the sort of the, the city level um, to look at a more national. I've got just a quick question for both of you, just a sort of a sentence answer, which is, if you're thinking about, um, Kirsten, you were saying that often people came together because it was about a campaign and so that their, their reason for being together was quite clear and things evolve over time. I sort of, how do you keep them interested and motivated? Um, and that's a question really for both of you that are working at a city level, just kind of a couple of top tips. I'll start with you, Kirsten, and I'll go back to Ninke. <laughs> Well, I think this has also a lot to do of not only how you keep them, but also how to protect them from the beginning. I mean, Ninke addressed the aspect of involving many uh, of the people from the beginning. Uh, one of the main issues I find really that activists in urban gardening are very often close to burnout, which is really crazy. And uh, I think one of the most important thing is to make it very clear from the beginning to share responsibility, but also to address the issue of capacities, uh, different capacities also, and to support and protect each other that we don't end up all completely stressed. Because uh, I must say, I'm, I'm super happy about my involvement in urban gardening, but sometimes it's just too much. I, I network much more than doing gardening, actually. And this, I think, uh, to show, I understand uh, that it can be stressful, but with solidarity uh, and with networking, we can help each other and maybe also unstress a little bit uh, the stress on single gardens. Because now I have to say, uh, because of this threat for single gardens, less and less people have the time and capacities to be involved in networks because they are so concerned to protect their gardens. And this, is, this cannot go on like this. I don't know exactly if I answered your question. Kirsten, but, you answered yeah. my question well, and it certainly resonates with what we see happening in Brighton and Hove. Um, Ninka, do you have anything you want to add to that point? <laughs> yeah, of course, there's many things to add. Uh, of course, it's very recognizable, everything you said so far, Kirsten. Um, uh, and it's really nice to hear a, a different tone of voice, of course, in Berlin, because you're different people than in Rotterdam. But we, the, the, I think the thing that we both really share is that we believe that you should collaborate and, and be strong. And I totally agree with you about this network thing. Uh, today, it's a really sunny day. It's been raining all week. But today, I have all these network meetings online. And I have to be there. I want to be there. I like to be there. But I'm not outside in the sunshine doing stuff with my hands. And I'm, yeah, it's it's kind of part of the deal. So we do share, take turns in who's doing the presentation when. And uh, I think you, we have to, to pick it up together. I'm not getting stressed yet. <laughs> so, because I am also in the green a lot and I work outside and I also have sometimes meetings like this outside, which internationally is quite something, but, when we're in Rotterdam, we try to invite the people from the municipality or the, the water authority or whoever we work with, the health uh, organizations, to go for a walk with us. So we have the meeting walking outdoors. So, And then we, we go along to visit the green initiatives. I think we should combine it more ourselves also with being outdoors so we don't get stressed out. Anyway, I'm getting off topic as well. Uh, it's, it's, a lovely, <laughs> it's a lovely thought. I have taken two things from the first uh, couple of presentations. One, yeah. which is the fact that we'd really prefer the networking to happen on the rainy days. Um, and the second is that very much the networking starts with the worms and the compost bin as the ultimate networking experience. <laughs> um, our next speaker is somebody who I know well, because Leon is from Sustainable Food Places, which is a UK-wide network of places who are looking 
to implement sustainable food um, solutions, which are quite similar to Edible City Solutions. It's just a different name. Um, I have to say Sustainable Food Places has been a huge support to the Food Partnership as an organisation. And it was this morning it was delightful because um, Lucy, who is from Sustainable Food Places in Liverpool, happened to pop up on my screen when we were in the a networking session. So that was a very nice moment. Um, Leon's favourite smell is a freshly cut orange. I'll hand over to him now. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Leon. I'm the Programme Manager for Sustainable Food Places, uh, SFP as we call it. I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, so we're Sustainable Food Places. We are a partnership between these three organisations ourselves, so we do understand collaboration and partnership working. Um, and what we believe is that the most impactful way to create in you know, really good local solutions to the food system is to collaborate, uh, to collaborate across sectors and to collaborate within within sectors, and also to take a whole food system approach. And we found that one of the most effective ways to deliver that is through a food partnership, through a local food partnership. And that's what we do. That's what SFP does. We support local food partnerships. There's currently 57 of these partnerships. Um, you can see them there on the map. Um, it's across the United Kingdom. Each place that joins, there are quite strict criteria about joining that includes working collaboratively and includes taking a systems approach. Uh, and we've been growing at an unprecedented rate uh, in our seven year history at the moment. Um, the food systems approach is really important to us. Um, we ask our members to address each of these six key issues that you can see on the left here. Um, this is our way of chopping up the food system. There are other ways, but this is to ensure that our members take a system approach and don't become a single issue. And, and you know, you all know this, but the reason behind it is really simple. It's that the food system is just that, a system. And if you don't take a systems approach, you just have, there is the danger of pushing a, an issue from one area to another and, and around and around it goes. We run campaigns. Our current feature campaign is Food for the Planet. And that's looking at all aspects of the ecological impact of the food system. And we're going to be running that campaign for the next few years. And we're also an awards program. Um, you can see the gold logo there. So we've got a bronze, silver and gold award. And it's really a way of benchmarking what places are doing with their food system locally. And um, one way to describe it, I suppose, is bronze is like a really good baseline for good activity across the food system. Places that get our silver award, are places that can be put on a sort of national platform, what they're doing is good practice. And then gold really, you know, gold is an international platform of really best practice. I often get asked what our food partnerships actually do. Um, what they tend not to do is deliver projects, time-bounded, funded-bounded projects. What they do do, and we we called it, it was actually one of our members, Good Food Oxford, who helped us with it, what we we call it is, is act as a backbone organization and i've heard some of that i heard thank you kirsten mentioned some of that activity as well but it's really the sort of things like convening lobbying uh delivering and supporting food strategies um consulting uh, all those things that really require quite a lot of personal time that's quite hard to fund um person time for something that isn't project based so we do fund our, each, each of our members has a coordinator and where we can, we do fund those coordinators to deliver this kind of, to, to create this kind of function for our food partnerships. Because we think it's the most effective to support those delivering projects that are somewhere central that can do this function, this backbone function. It's essentially about creating additionality, actually. It, it's about what happens when you bring people together, food actors, food stakeholders across the system, Bring them together what good things happen when they're brought together that wouldn't have happened otherwise very hard to measure very hard to get funded um I, i'm from sheffield this is sheffield here it's a ex-industrial city and you know any city now i guess you're, what you're asking yourselves is kind of city feed itself well sheffield already does feed itself um but the question is you know can it feed itself sustainably you know where the impact on people and planet is, is not a negative one um, a lot of people get in touch with me and our programme with solutions to the food system, for, uh, 
and they're often like this is the solution um and you'll recognize a lot of these you know vertical growing growing like soil uh platforms that connect producers to uh consumers you know a lab meat uh insects all these things none of them we don't think at sfp that any of them are the single solution it's about a range of solutions and it's about collaboration um i'll just give a very quick example from my home city about how that collaboration can work in practice and this is what we support this collaboration locally um this is talking about market gardens and when i say market gardens i'm not thinking about uh, therapeutic growing or very small growing in small spaces which you know we support which is what i'm talking about we're also not talking about farming we're talking about two or three acres um, and very often blending the old with the new old market gardens until recently have always fed cities and new because the approach has changed and in sheffield as an example the approach has changed in three ways uh the structure their methods and their supply chain it's a different structure um because there's a lot of social enterprises who, who are doing this market gardening um they're not charities but they're not entirely profit driven either so people can earn a living but the profits do stay within the organization the methods are different it's organic but it's a kind of intensive new organic uh so high yield but low environmental impact and the supply chain is different because they're not selling to supermarkets with all the problems that brings like dodgy contracts or very low farm gate prices so mostly it's a veg box schemes and here you can see Sheffield organic growers this is another example of collaboration this is five plots all with their own businesses but all working together they're sharing resources the share organic certification which my employer the, the uh, soil association was uh, not too happy about to start with but now they've come around to the idea of that um and they share equipment um, and skills and so on and then they sell into a local market in this case they sell a lot to another cooperative called the gather which is where the food partnership in Sheffield is also based um who then supply food veg boxes so you know all five businesses are only living um when, when all this was set up the worry that there's no demand the demand isn't a problem supply is now the problem i mean we gather are selling over 500 boxes a week now employing 10 people and bringing you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds that are staying in the economy so they're shortening food chains it's a working circular food system providing jobs and good food so this is our approach to sustainable food places is local solutions will be quite complex it will involve collaboration. It might involve new ways of thinking. So it's all about partnership. Um, and I do emphasize partnership, not just between sectors, but within sectors. I've been in a number of meetings where it is at a local food partnership meeting where different members of the local authority have met each other for the first time. Um, and, and, and that's what we try to do, is bring people together. And eventually, you know, the, 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 the holy grail is to embed all this in food policy. But we support our food partnerships, whether that's the case or not, and just let them get on with it. Um, a lot of uh, what I was asked to do is look at how we sustain, nurture, connect the network. We do it through a, a you know a, a quite a wide range of different methods, and I can go into this uh, later and in detail if you're interested in any of these particular ways that we keep our network inspired, connected, supported um but i will say it's all about connection you know i've heard about the burnout of local activists yes we we know about the same issue in the uk um just finding time to listen just connecting people up you know having something that might be a bit social and it's not work uh you know your conference over here um that you know i put create a family feeling you know really connecting with people um but most of this you'll find is peer-to-peer -peer support sfp recognized that the experts are our members and our job is just to connect them up um so that's it for me but here they are here are our coordinators from our conference probably three years ago because we don't have all the last two years um and we you know strongly believe that you know it's more than a network it's more about a, a good food movement in the uk thank you Thank you, Leon. And I can see myself at the front there waving oh. a spoon. Why am I always the one that gets a prop? Um, I guess one of the things that as a person who's part of this network, I'll also feed in is that 
actually one of the things it does to um, as being a member of it is it actually helps save you time. And sometimes putting out an ask on a network email list of has anybody done the same thing and getting some help back again is probably one of the most valuable things that we find um, because everybody's time is so precious. So thank you for that, Leon. As I say, there's lots of questions coming in on the questions and answers and we will come to them. Um, people are answering some of the specific ones as we go along, which is also great. Um, the next person I'm going to introduce to you is Kai. Um, and whilst Kai is going to be talking about a German network of edible cities, he's also involved with Mundrav, which is all about orchards. So I wasn't surprised that Kai's favourite smell um, involves an apple, but it's actually what it is, is a potato pancake with apple sauce, which sounds lovely. Thank you, Kai. <laughs> Hello, thank you, Vic, for your introduction. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um... Oh, first of all, okay, a um, few words uh, about uh, pancakes. And um, so uh, this is a nice memory to my grandmother. She made these pancakes from her garden. So the potatoes were from her garden and the eggs were from her chicken yard and the apples were from, from her garden as well. So um, nice memory. And it always led to eating contests when my cousins and my sister were there as well. So we ate like 10 or 15 of these pancakes. So very nice memory. Yeah, as you said, I'm I'm a founder of, of Mundrau. I'm also running a little label for organic spices and I'm a fruit arborist. So I'm very much involved um, in um, with food and food related issues. Uh, I will start my presentation. The project that I'm talking about is uh, We Are Edible uh, and it's, it's not really a network yet because when I when I listen to you, um, listen to you, Kerstin, a network means that you you have a common vision and a common vision with all the people. It's mainly it's it's coming from the bottom. It's a bottom up uh, approach, and what we're doing is more a top down thing. And uh, to understand that, we have to go back to history, how this uh, developed, and you will understand what I'm talking about. So. Yeah, I, I found it with a few people 12 years ago, uh, mundrop.org. It's, it's a fruit map. It's a, it's a harvest map, basically, in the German-speaking world. It works like, um, like that. You, you find a place where, where an edible plant grows, like an apple tree or a herb or a, like a raspberry bush, whatever. And you can add this to this map, and it's visible to others. So and what, uh, yeah, in, in the last 10, 12 years, uh, a massive edible landscape in the internet has evolved so far. Um, and it's, it's a private thing. So you can, as a private person, you can add um, places in, in mundrop.org. Around four years ago, um, like cities or like staff from cities started adding uh, edible places as well, like official fruit trees that belong to, to the city that stand on city ground. And uh, several cities followed. So now it's like 17, I think, or 15 cities that have added places by hand manually. And we thought, well, that's a bit awkward. Uh, why not offering them a service that makes it easier to them to publish their fruit trees if they want, if they wish to show it to their uh, citizens. And we developed a little tool, um, an importer. Um, so we offer them, like city authorities, to give us their official tree inventory, like data, GIS based data. We filter the fruit bearing uh, trees out of this huge database and import it into Mundrau. So and then it's visible and it's, it's on the Mundrau map so everyone can see it. And it's still owned, like the data are still owned by the city and they can still delete it, but it's visible uh, as, a, as an edible resource in, in the city. And to make it visible to their citizens, they can um, could generate an iframe, so like it's a, it's a little window. They, they find the place on mundrop.org and um, extract it from the map and embed it on their website. So they can show it to their people, look at this, this is this you can use. And so that's what many cities do already. 
and we thought, well, okay, why not um, list them, like make a catalog of uh, interested uh, of cities that are into fruit trees uh, that are interested to develop their fruit resources further. And we created We Are Edible, Wir sind Espa, this uh, website, which you see here. So Kirchlangen is a small, it's, it's a city in the south of Germany. And they, they also, um, yeah, describe their vision what what else they like apart from fruit trees what else they are planning to do and uh, activities uh, that happen in their um in in this uh, small city um this is the status quo like 17 cities have created a profile on or like towns cities and little smaller local communities have a profile on Mundo and have published their the data manually, 15 of them are members. I call them members, but yeah, they they are in a like a business um, contact with us uh, on Visit Espa and publish their tree inventory as open data. And we thought, well, that's just uh, this is one way, right? We 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 offering people, we offering these people um, a service, but there's no interaction. It's not really a network yet. So we organized a first sit-in session uh, in the end of January to learn our learn about who are our clients actually what what are their needs what what is their what are their dreams where do they want to be in five years and um, so that was the first um, sit-in like yeah a couple of weeks ago and uh, these are the some minutes I want to share with you like 10, I think 10 cities um, took, took part. And uh, yeah, they are interested in funding opportunities. What, what, where can they get funding from to, to set up uh, an edible city scheme in their city? Um, they're also interested, are interested in physical maps for edibles, for schools, also for touristic reasons. Uh, they are interested in signs on trees to educate uh, the citizens about uh, sorts and about the way how to harvest and all that. And they are also willing to share their knowledge in this like evolving network. There is one city, they have a quite interesting concept of an edible museum park. So they want to trans transform a museum park into an edible park. They are, yeah, some have, have experiences with regional brand marketing, food related brands. And uh, very interesting, many of them have birth tree parks, like with fruit trees, like every suckling, every newborn baby gets a fruit tree, but this tree stands there, but it's not pruned and maintained. So I think there's a lot of, um, because I'm an arborist, I know you need, these trees need care and they need, um, pruning every year in the first uh, 15 years. A wedding tree park is, is, um, is in, in, yeah, in, in one uh, municipality. So there's, yeah, it's quite fruit, fruit related. So we thought, okay, um, we are publishing now like to help them to find the right people, the, the right arborist, the right professional worker to help them. We, we are publishing a brochure now, a guideline to tendering professional food care, tree care. So they can formulate what do they actually need to, to, um, to make a, a healthy and stable fruit tree out of a, out of a birth tree. So this one is coming up, <clears throat> it will be published in um, April this year. Um, well, all like all these activities I just mentioned are, we framed them, yeah, we made a, made a frame around them and uh, a price label. And the first one I mentioned, this, this um, open data um, import, we call it transparency and visibility. So this is the service we are offering. The second one, like the uh, um, planting and maintaining and pruning trees is the growth and conservation section. And the third one is a bit more complex and not developed well because this is where Eddie Sidnett comes um, on the playground. It's uh, everything we are learning in this project now, we would like to transfer from the European level to the smaller, like to the 
national level in Germany. For instance, this uh, transition pathway methodology from Buko Vienna, we would love to offer this to cities in Germany that are interested to transfer their city into an edible place and also other um, ECSs so to yeah, transfer them this knowledge to the German um, auditorium. Um, yeah, this is actually our mission and our vision because we haven't um, we haven't discussed that with the cities that are in the so-called network. We would like to connect people in joy with nature and with each other, and would want to support the growth of livable, sustainable, and resilient places, especially in the urban areas. And yeah, that's this, that's what we are. Where, where we are now, and I'm interested um, in the discussion. If you think that this has a potential to become a, a real network, or if it's just a service platform that we, where we offer services to these uh, cities, because a network is you put energy in, as you, every one of you said it, you need a lot of energy to put in communication, time, and you have to see what what you get out of out of it. Thank you, Kai. Um, I have no doubt that you haven't noticed because you've been busy presenting, but in the chat, people have been putting in links and um, comments about where they have like similar sort of foraging maps or um, lists of where people can find things in different places. And I definitely encourage everybody to do that because it's really helpful to be able to see where there are similar things like that going on. Um, before I move to our next speaker, uh, we have all been uh, sat very still listening, all 80 participants that are around the world. So I'm gonna get everybody just to stand up. Uh, I want you to have a little shake around, okay? I want you to uh, tap your ears because they've been listening a lot. Stretch your eyes, okay? I want us to feel like we're coming back into this room, um, having had a little stretch of ourselves um, before moving to the next section because one of the things I would certainly say in terms of having moved to a much more online life is that it's great because you can do things like this and bring people together without having to get on an aeroplane. However, it does mean you sit really still. <laughs> Thank you everybody for joining in there. Um, and I am now going to hand over um, to our next speaker, who is Jan Elko, who is going to be speaking about um, a European sort of forum, but his Apex smell is a garden in early morning in springtime. And the thing I particularly loved about this was the use of the phrase apex smell, because it was one of those things where I was like, yes, that's what I meant. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Good afternoon. I will share my screen. Um, so it's a big leap to the EU, but uh, also in Brussels, it's, it's a growing awareness that urban agriculture, uh, local food production, lo local food consumption is, uh, should be at the agenda. So uh, FOI is an uh, EU funded program. It's, it's a sister program of Edible Cities, um, but focusing on uh, urban agriculture and getting urban agriculture at the table in Brussels. Um, this doesn't work. Uh, I wanted to continue with my presentation, but um, the computer doesn't want, sadly. Is one of the technical team just able to put the presentation on instead? Yeah, because uh, something is wrong. Yes. Thanks, Marissa. I try again. Yes. Um, so uh, I'm talking about uh, unlocking the potential of urban agriculture. We all know, and we are all in the business, so to say, um, maybe urban agriculture in, in, in the global north is about two decades. Um, and, and of course, we have to understand that urban agriculture is connected to urban life since we people live in cities, uh, maybe 10,000 years. Um, but now in modern days, yeah, we need an, better knowledge better policies, deployment and networking in urban agriculture. And talking ab about better knowledge is we have to talk about 
yes, a shared feeling of, about what is urban agriculture, what kind of typologies we're talking about. Uh, if we, as, as uh, and I'm consider myself also, also as a practitioner, I'm also a scientist, but I'm, I'm a, let's say, a practical scientist, a gardening for more than 45 years. Um, if we talk with, with policies, uh, there should be an, an, an shared knowledge about what, what kind of policies we have. So we carried out last year a, a survey across Europe about what is urban agriculture. Um, and based on this survey and also on expert interviews, and maybe you participated in one of the of these um, uh, surveys or uh, expert interviews, um, we extracted six types, six typologies of urban agriculture. And of course, as a disclaimer, there are a lot of gray zones between them. But first of all, we have the urban farm, maybe the professional family farm business. Uh, in the hinterland or in the peri-urban area, um, semi-professional, professional. Then we have, I think, emerging um, the zero acres farming. So it is uh, the indoor farming, vertical farming, but also um, floating farming, uh, box farming, uh, and so on. Could be professional, could be in the backyard. Um, the, the third typology is social farm driven by NGOs, sometimes professional, semi-professional, but yeah, you can see it as therapeutic uh, gardens or uh, gardens where people with distance to the labor market reintegrate. Um, I think you all have examples uh, in your city or in your neighborhood. Uh, then do-it-yourself gardening. Yeah, allotment gardening, for example, is, is do it yourself. Uh, families or, or persons work on their own plot, producing food and fruits. Community parks, <clears throat> um, that it's more or less a combination of different types within a park. So food production, edible plants, but also social activities in and around food. And the sixth one is more a smaller one is the community garden. So in backyard of a, uh, or in the neighborhood with small groups of people having a um, good time uh, at small spots intra most of the time. Okay, then talking about typology is the next step is what are the benefits? Because if you talk with politicians, it's also about what are benefits? What, what do we share about uh the understanding but also um uh, what is the added value of these types of urban agriculture so that's what we now work on within our program um this is one of the things we want to deliver this summer uh, and of course we have also to talk about unwanted effects of urban agriculture i can't understand there are unwanted effects but maybe they, there are so we have to be that clear about that um so this is what, what we're carrying out. We're also working on policies, of course, and on governance, um, um, but I'm more in the, in the typology and the benefits. So uh, I, uh, that's what why the reason that I explain more about that. Um, we have but several partners from Denmark to Bulgaria, um, NGOs, but also uh, science-driven organizations. But key, it pivots around a, a forum. We want to create a forum at EU level where uh, people from different backgrounds come together and share knowledge, uh, networks, policies about what is urban agriculture. And could we take another step or more, a leap with urban agriculture, not only to Brussels, but also again to the local level? Um, and then uh, maybe to, <clears throat> I would eagerly want to share with you that we also organize an online. Uh, uh, so with our, <laughs> you are the uh, Edible Sisters, as I, was, I, I consider as a sister program. <clears throat> uh, we, uh, at the other part, we want to organize uh, a conference where we will discuss <clears throat> about this topology, about the benefits of urban agriculture and so on. It's also an online and please put it in your agenda uh, 29th till 30th of March. Uh, and of course, follow the announcements on our website of everyone. So I hope I can invite you there as well. Although maybe you get bored about all these uh, online meetings, but I think uh, it is a very effective way 
to share uh, experiences, knowledges locally, but also on the EU level. And hopefully that will bring us also in the EU, EU a, a step further uh, in, uh, in Brussels. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things that I will ask um, all of the speakers as we come to the end is to think about how they balance the time for like the network building and the sort of perhaps some of the doing um, and actually sort of thinking about what, what strategies you have around that. Um, but I'm now going to bring our final speaker in, Anna, who is um, based at the University of Barcelona, but is actually going to be talking about some global um, sort of networks around this agenda. Now, Anna also had oranges as her favourite smell, but Anna's got a family background in orange production. So hers particularly had the smell of your oranges on your hand, which Leon, I think probably oranges don't grow in Sheffield. So I doubt that that was quite the same experience for you. <laughs> I'd like to hand over to Anna now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, Big, and thanks everybody for uh, your presentation. It's, it's always very nice to um, share the space with practitioners and learn so much of what's going on in the ground, which is, is so much, isn't it? There's, there's so many great initiatives and so much uh, work going on and so much, so many transformations. As Big was saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, networks and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, city food networks and, and how how they have been evolving and, and where are we at uh, with this. Uh, and the uh, presentation from Leon was very useful for me because it kind of like sets up the scene of like a, a national food network and also what's what's going on in other places. So um, as many of you are probably aware, in the last uh, years, there's been an explosion of activity around uh, food and cities and food policies and food strategies. And it seems that almost everywhere now is, is engaging with, with this agenda. This is a map that we that we developed with, um, with different networks. And here you can see how there are national networks and international networks. And, and, and where you see the dots that are a bit bigger is because those cities are engaged in different types of networks at the, at the same time. And this is just like a, a bit of a glimpse of, of, of what's going on because there are many networks that are not um, like properly mapped. They, they have a much more like flexible um, membership. So, so they don't have this kind of like uh, this, this type of, of, of monitoring or follow up in terms of mapping. But I just wanted to show you this picture in terms of like hundreds and hundreds of cities getting together through all these different uh, city, city food networks. Um, and uh, there are some of my research has been going uh, uh, has been uh, focusing on on what are these city networks why are there so many what types of networks there are what are they doing and trying to understand a bit more like how they support work in the ground so we have different types of networks depending on on their geographies there, there are national networks there are regional networks like european networks but there are also uh, global networks we have networks that are independent that they are just created for to work around sustainable food in cities, but there are other networks like, for example, C40, that uh, that was created uh, to work on um, on climate change, but now uh, has a, a, a track that is around around food or Euro cities in Europe that was created to work around um, the agenda of cities in in general, and now is also working on food. So we have like networks that have been purposefully built in the last uh, years, and some of them that are just like uh, that that they have created a working group around around food. As Leon was saying, they, for example, in the UK, there are some specific requirements to be part of this of, of this network that is. Re is related to the uh, to, to the level of commitment and also the stage of development of their urban food policy in the case of, of, of the UK, of the Sustainable Food Places Network. But there are all the networks that what they ask is for a fee, what they ask is that you are a certain type of city. For example, as I was saying, C40 is around mega cities, so you have to be a big city to be part of these networks. Um, but there are others that are more open to any type of city, no, no matter the size. And others that what they ask you is that there's some mayoral commitment or there's some sort of like activity going on. But others are much more flexible and you can just be part of them and be part of the community of practice without having to have a, 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 previous, a previous commitment. 
these networks also have different decision making structures uh, in terms of like how they organize what they do and, and, and what they, they and, 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 and the type of activities that they develop. We have some of them that are led or that they are facilitated by civil society organizations or, or technical stuff. Like for example, in the US, the Food Policy Network, the Sustainable Food Cities Network, that now is Sustainable Food Places in the UK, C40, as I was mentioning, or City Food, which, was, which is a network that was created as a collaboration between ICLE, um, that is a network for uh, municipalities around sustainability, and the Rua Foundation. But we have also other networks that have other types of, of ways of deciding what they are going to be doing, because we have to be mindful that this network that they are putting together is many different places and many different perspectives and many different activities. And, and, uh, and there are some networks where what, what they have is a, a committee of elected cities, and also they have civil society organizations or technical stuff that helps with the facilitation. But cities have like this, like, steering committee or board where the, where the main decisions are, are taken. And this is an example of the Spanish network Agroeco Cities or a network around organic food in Europe that's called Organic Cities. This is the case of the Milan Food Policy Pact. The um, Dutch city deal, which is a very interesting initiative that has cities, but also regional government and also uh, national policy makers or the case of, of Euro cities. And finally, what we have as well is some networks where, that they create these more loose and flexible communities of practice where they come together around specific projects or for a specific uh, agenda, uh, like UCLG, which is um, a very big network uh, that operates at the United Nations level and, and gathers many municipalities around the world. Or Orufogar, which is more about regions and not so much about municipalities, and they are both very engaged in United Nations debates and spaces. But what they do is to, that they work through food, uh, they work around food through these kind of like more flexible activities and approaches without a, 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 a much more defined structure. So, what are the roles of these uh, of these city networks? Um, so. What these networks are, are really doing, one of the key aspects of it is that they want to exchange knowledge and they want to co-produce that knowledge. So they want to learn from what's happening in other places, but also create new knowledge that can be used across places. So as, as one of the persons that I, uh, the people that I interview was saying, what we do is we match demand for knowledge expertise from cities with supply of knowledge expertise from other cities. So it's basically about this city to city learning, peer to peer learning in order to understand better and strengthen uh, action on the ground. And this is particularly effective, uh, not only at the international level, but at the national level where you share the same regulatory context. And in many cases, like the challenges on the ground, this is very useful. Some networks are as well as doing this, uh, are doing this lobbying and representative role, what they want to do is to push for change at different spaces. And for example, Euro cities in Europe, what they really want to do is to be the voice of cities in the European Commission, and they are really active in doing so. Uh, around food as well uh, lately. So they have this lobbying capacity at different uh, levels of, of government. They are also these networks about implementation and monitoring. We can see uh, recently the Milano Urban Food Policy Pact is very engaged in implementing European projects with like some of, of, of the cities that have signed the pact as part of these European projects doing the specific activities, but also have developed this monitoring framework in order to understand how progress is being made. And this helps and understanding what's going on in different places and how things are, are evolving. Another aspect that I think is very important that these city networks are doing is that from very place-based activities, very on the ground activities, they are creating this vision that goes beyond your specific context, your specific place, your specific city. So you have the capacity to have this, what we call translocal action or capacities and vision as well. So you can act collective, collectively as a network, but you also can act in distributed ways. You can, you can be part of the network and, and adhere to many of the things that they are doing, but also you can have your own agenda and also do uh, your own activities at the, at the local level, which uh, in, a, in a world that we live riddled with politics, this is sometimes very, very important. And with this idea of the vision, I think uh, one of the key examples that we have, and that is a long-standing one, is th these awards that, that the Sustainable Food Places Network in the UK has developed, that they give us like a, a collective vision of what is, um, what is a, a, 
a, a, a bronze uh, city, what is a gold city in terms of sustainable food, and creates this common understanding and, and, and allows to push the agenda further uh, at different levels. And finally, it would be this capacity to act at different scales. So because the networks, what they do is that they go beyond the local uh, beyond the city um, or beyond the municipality, they're able to push conversations and to push campaigns at the national or international level. And again, the UK is an example of that, but also here in Spain, we have a, a national network that has been pushing for, uh, that has been developing different campaigns, for example, around um, sustainable and healthy food. And, and that creates kind of like a common framework to also push for change as we know in national at the national space where there are many burdens in terms of like being able to to advance so just to wrap up a little bit uh, around this as you can see there are many networks that are doing many things many there's there's a lot of activity and there's been a lot of conversation around coordination and cooperation and how these networks interact and how and what is the potential to transform the food system and how they can they can uh, they can do that and do it uh, and do it better. I think one of the of the key things is the, this importance of the uh, multi scalar interventions and how they are able to push and to and to unlock a, a bit the the. Um, the deadlocks that we have uh, in terms of policies at different level, not only at the city level, but also at the national level or even international level. But in order to do so, it's important that these networks and also other actors that are, that that uh, that are active in, for example, the national level or, or the European level, align better their their agendas, but also the, their capacities and their competences. Um, the second one would be to make the case for these networks. And uh, Leon was talking about backbone organizations and the importance of them and how difficult it is to fund them. Well, it's difficult to fund networks as well uh, because they are they are this this the kind of like soft infrastructure, uh, and they and they fulfill some roles that many funders are not. They don't see kind of like the impact in very in very material ways in some ways. So so we need to still make the case for to fund these connective infrastructures such as networks, but also backbone organizations, which are the ones that also help not only developing networks at city, national, international levels, but also to kind of like get, get activity going on the ground to be able to get people um, together. Many of these networks are, are also working with, with city officials, which is key, but but in, in, in many cases, not in all of them, uh, but other stakeholders are not involved. So I think it is important for networks to be able to have ways of engaging with different types of stakeholders in the terms of the capacity that these stakeholders have to change the food system, but at the same time, to uh, expand a little bit the diversity of the agents involved. And when I talk about diversity, I talk about socioeconomic background, I'm talking about race, we're talking about gender, we're talking about all these issues that many times are underrepresented. And as we scale up, normally they are even uh, less represented. And we also see this in terms of like gaps of like, where are these, these networks more active in the world? And finally, um, as we as I was highlighting the level the, the aspect of inequality, we also have other elements related to inequality as we get together and 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 we put more cities together. Of course, the cities with more resources, more capacity, more time from the staff are able to engage in more activities, they are able to participate in projects, to put together bids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it is important that as we develop these networks, we also provide platforms for those cities that have fewer resources and less capacity to be able to really benefit from this collective knowledge that is being generated and also from the resources that have been distributed. Uh, and, and we can see how some cities are able to engage much less than than others in this kind of like in this global mobilization of like sustainable food cities. Uh, here below, I, I just put the um, the paper that uh, in which this presentation is based that has been recently published and is open access. So if anybody wants to read a bit more about that, uh, you can have it there. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. And um, I'm sure all the resources and can, links and everything can be shared with people afterwards. Um, so whilst that's the end of all of our presentations, um, and I am going to move on to asking some questions that have come up in the question and answer chat in a minute, 
I think it's only fair in the uh, kind of spirit of sharing that I also shared with you my favourite smell when it comes to food. And it is actually frying onions. And that could be because it's me starting to cook something in my kitchen. But also as a real city dweller, it is also the late night smell when you're walking home from somewhere and the hot dog van is on the corner of the street cooking the onions. So I'm going to put my fried onions up onto the uh, up there with everybody else's healthy foods that they picked. Um, and then we can have a little bit of fun because we're going to try and use something on Zoom, which is the poll voting system with all our participants here today, because we're actually going to vote as to, of all the smells that have been put forward by the panellists, what is the conference's favourite smell? So you should have come up on your screen, which hosts, um, hosts and panellists, sorry, you can't vote because you've already had a vote. Um, but looking at everybody else, you should actually have the... Um, different options that have come out. And um, if you'd like to vote, once we finish doing some questions, I'll get uh, Marissa to uh, share with us what the answers are. Um, so being a bit more serious again now, I will come back and I'll look at some of the questions. And actually it was one that came in very, very early. Um, and it was actually aimed initially, I think at Ninka and Kirsten, but at, it's basically about um, strategies for getting different types of network to collaborate um, and work together. So for example, the food or the people that are involved in the environment. And I wonder if either of you have got any thoughts that you'd like to sort of put in on that one. Sure, I guess we both have. Uh, I think it's uh, good to get people together on a shared uh, interests and maybe shared threats or shared um, uh, opportunities, uh, and and I think in in Rotterdam we have we're we're past the the concurrence or or you know uh, we're not opposite each other anymore. We're really joining forces and doing it together. And I think most of the green initiatives, the ECSs here, see the 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 larger value of joining forces because we all want to sustain ourselves. Yeah. Kerstin, Dad. Uh, I, I would like to address an issue that is super important in our activities, which is fun. And uh, I think uh, fun can be a very good motivation to join together in all these issues we have to deal with that, not always, that are not always funny. And also very practical things, to do together very practical things. Just to give you an example, I talked about this Forum Stadtgärtnern, which is a network of community and allotment gardens in Berlin. And these allotment gardens, they, since uh, two or three years, they made a magazine which was actually addressing allotment gardens. And so last year, uh, we did it together as community gardens and allotment gardens together. We published this magazine and we invited other initiatives uh, to write an article about it. So we had uh, a, a very important introduction by the head of the BUND, which is an, uh, the Germany's organization for nature protection and environment. And we also invited other uh, initiatives to join uh, this kind of platform to share this initiative. And of course, uh, to share this magazine. And of course, it is fun. You have to communicate and you get closer together. So I think the roof of uh, urban green space and health um, I think it's a very, a very good glue uh, for us in uh, cooperating uh, with um, food initiatives and other green space uh, activists. Yeah. Thank you. I also say often that sometimes working on something together that is like a bit fun or successful, sometimes when we have organized an event that brings together different things. So for example, a Feeding the 5000 event to raise the issue of food waste actually the success of doing something together means that you then later on when you have differences have a shared sort of sense of connection with each other so i would often say trying to do things together that are really positive actually also has a longer term benefit as well thank you um the next question that i'm pulling out which actually has come out in a couple of different ways um and it is actually about the really complicated question of resources and how actually it's very, very hard sometimes to express what the benefit of a network or an alliance or, you know, some, some of these um, different 
language we're using here. And I guess I'm probably going to aim this one slightly at Leon and Anna in terms of going, do you have any tips to share with people about how both being able to tell the narrative and getting the resources for this work has worked? Want me to go first, Anna? Or... Um, in terms of resources, uh, it is difficult. You need, you need a, a funder who understands what you're about. But sometimes the most uh, effective ways of connecting people aren't always the ones that take the most resources. Uh, we did a review of our, our comms channels uh, a few years ago, and we've got some really interesting stuff, some of it costs a lot of money, some of it doesn't. And it was our email forum, which is fairly self-regulating, where people come on and can discuss any issues, whether it's very practical, you know, do you know vegan catering in Birmingham, right up to how do I engage my local authority in developing a food strategy? You know, that, that's done on a, I think it's a free platform, um, Rise Up. Um, and it's very, very effective. And as, as long as everybody knows why they're going on there and broadly agree to some rules, then it, you know, there are some cost-effective ways of doing it. I mean, the way I see SFP is that we're just like a generous host. You know, we create a space, but we don't try and control too much or set the agenda. I think there's a mistake when you try and do that. And then it also becomes more resource heavy. It's about creating a really good space that those people in that network, whether it's a small one or a large one, can set the agenda. One of the successful regional networks we ever did in London for our members in SFP, it cost us the price of, I think, 12 coffees and 12 cakes, you know. Um, and it was in the back of a cafe, and obviously that was absolutely fantastic. So it doesn't have to be big conferences or quite complex um, networking tools or anything like that, just creating a space, whether it's online or in person. But it, it still takes resources. And to make the case is quite difficult. Um, you know, you need to prove that additionality that actually having an effect on the ground and an impact. Uh, you know, we know it, we know it does. Um, but you know, it, it is very difficult. You know, if you put two, two, two people, two organizations together, how do you prove that it was you putting them together that then led them to doing something good later on? You know, they might not even remember that in the first meeting, it might, you know, so. It is difficult. Uh, we're lucky to our funders who understand it. Uh, but Anna might know more about how you make that case. <laughs> Anna. Yeah, I will share that it, it, is, it is difficult. I, I do think that there's a bit of a change in terms of perception around, around this, um, in terms of funders. I mean, there are many different types of funders. I think you have from you can have funding from the from the uh, public sector, you can have uh, funding from foundations, which I think are the ones that are being more open to this experimentation and and I do think at the European level there's a lot now around trying to fund spaces for co-production and allowing that kind of like process of like co-producing knowledge co-producing solutions actually to to emerge so I do think that there's been there's been a change um but it's true that we have had so little and there's still so little funding compared to all the work that that needs to be done. So I, I suppose there's something about making the case that it does have an impact, like working together, that having professional facilitation and having people's pay time for networking, it is it, it can be uh, relevant. It can be like a game changer, mostly if you want to engage certain types of, of, of people, of groups with certain circumstances that they also deserve. Um, deserve to be rewarded uh, for their time. So I, I, I think many of us are trying to make the case more for that. And, and I hope that also some of the research that we're doing shows the importance of these backbone organizations being able to actually network and how that kind of like really um, fosters and, and, and has like a greater impact sometimes like just kind of like keeping yourself isolated. So I would say, uh, yeah, try to make the case for like working together has like an impact, it's a win-win solution. It has like that kind of, it activates all those synergies. And in isolation, we really can not do that, that very much. And, and maybe I can share some resources in terms of like how people are, are putting that forward sometimes. Just one more thing on that, and I'm not entirely joking, is um, call it a project, not a network. You might get me funding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, could I, could I? I was going to say, Yana, do you want to actually come in here? I was oh, just like you. looking yeah, at you, yeah. but I didn't know if you knew where I was on the screen. No, 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 no. 
Um, because I'm also in uh, for many years in, in networks in the Netherlands, uh, and my experience is that you have as 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 an uh, initiative, you have to be keen on what is on the policy agenda, and and that might differ from city to city to to location to location, um, because maybe you think your urban agriculture initiative is 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 good for uh, reducing poverty, but at the agenda at city level is health the key. So sometimes you have to switch and to be yeah uh, keen what's at the table um, because we know that many um, politics is, and, and policies are segregated. So it's whether it's about health, it's about green or it's about uh, space. Uh, so an integration because urban agriculture and urban food is, is about integration of many things. So sometimes you have to put forward one thing uh, in favor of your budget or the other one. Uh, and that's the reason that we, 10 years ago, we, a decade ago, we developed a game. So initiatives could play a game with politicians. And of course, it's not about the game, but it's about getting uh, in, uh, in speech with each other, getting and, and know each other. And, and, uh, and, and that was hel very helpful to, yeah, to get uh, yeah to get to get on the same table and uh, to have um, the same talk and and that helped many initiatives to to get support from uh, local or uh, national policies. Thank you. I, th I, I think that's a really useful tip because sometimes if you are going with a problem as a policymaker and that problem is health and the person only talks about environment, it doesn't look like a solution. So, um, and I think the whole point of the EDISIP project is, is about this idea of the social, the environmental. It's like all of these things that the economic, they all overlap. Um, Anna, there's a very specific question that's come into you. I'll come back to you in a minute, Kristen, so you can be thinking about it, which is on your map, it looks like most of the network in Europe um, what is happening in Asia and Africa, where most of the global urban population will be living. I will let you think about that while I go back to Kirsten, who just put a hand up there on that point. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add something um, to this idea of, uh, you know, what are the policies at the moment? I must say, I think initiatives and networks are very often, you know, juggling with what is going on, what are the keywords, what are, is, you know, the mystical uh, at the moment. And of course, we deal with, you know, what can we use of the corona crisis for, you know, you know, all of this. But I must say the, the best gift, and I think the Edisid Net, um, net uh, the network is um, very much helping in this. It's really, for me, quite a new experience that is on a good way uh, we can improve, but uh, is the departmental uh, the cross departmental cooperation in the administration, because uh, as activists, you always address, you know, you pick different people who don't talk to each other, but it's it's so complex. Uh, the urban, uh, I mean, food, um, and it's it's about education, it's about health, it's about urban development, everything. So this is really for me a, a key. Um, that administration and also, of course, politicians can do for us as activists and for the society, actually. Thank you. Um, I also agree. And I think it's one of those things that actually when people have been around a long time, like you said, you have been doing this for a long time. What happens is you begin to know people in different places and then they move perhaps to a different job. And actually all those connections and contacts are probably one of the most valuable things you have as an activist. Um, so, Anna, are you ready for your question about what's happening in Asia and Africa? Um. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Um, I, uh, well, in, in the point that you were just making, I also, I, I think for, for us, for academics, like our most valuable, I think the, the most valuable thing I have to do my work and actually to get embedded in, in what is in reality happening in cities and things like this is actually being in contact with all the people that are making change happens so I do think it's like one of the the things that people ask me about like oh when you were here what have you learned from here or from there and, and being able to translate or to kind of like share those experiences is very valuable um, in terms of what's happening in different places it is true that in terms of like their participation in formalized networks in terms of like developing national networks there's there's non no national networks that we're that I am aware of right now being created in different countries in Africa and or Asia they are participating in some of these networks like the C40 which is international 
International, the ICLE RUAF City Food Network, or the Milan Food Policy Pact. But if you see the Milan Food Policy Pact, which is a bit like where everybody is in some ways, um, uh, you really see that it is heavily geared towards Europe to start with, and, and then uh, its activity in Africa and Asia is much lower. It has increased, um, and, they are, and then they are making the effort to to increase those uh, the activity that is happening there, but it is true that is it, that it is a slow process. In the case of, of of Africa, what I've been able to speak with some colleagues there is that still the city agenda, uh, the city food agenda, is progressing slowly because food is such a big thing at the national level in terms of policies that uh, there are some tensions there in terms of like who is driving this agenda and where is the the funding going uh, going to in terms of like doing uh, food policy in this country. So, so it's still kind of like very a national topic and, and also very linked to rural areas in many cases as well. So there's, there's some kind of like things around discourse around food policy there uh, as well. And, and one of the things that is happening as well is that there are connections and there are things happening, but uh, they are less formalized than actually being part of this network and doing this or doing that. But they might be happening as, as you were just mentioning before, of like people that know each other, they have collaborated and they are actually exchanging knowledge and doing things together, but not under the umbrella of like a formalized network. Thank you, Anna. Um, we have about two minutes left of this session. So I wondered if anybody from my panel wanted to just come in with any other thoughts about how you can engage perhaps those groups at any level uh, that perhaps are less engaged currently in your networks. If you've got any tips of things you've tried, um, what has been successful and just wave your hand at me if somebody wants to come in on this one. <laughs> Go on, Leon. <laughs> Um, what, what we found works best, well, it's what our members have found works best, and we just share the best practice, is that if you want to engage um, not the usual suspects and harder to reach communities, then you have to make an extra effort. You have to go to those communities and engage them, whether it's a place or a time that works for them. Um, so have a real think about how you're doing that engagement um, and not just, you know, I've seen it where there's been a consultation and it's been at nine o'clock on a Monday morning in the middle of the city and it takes time to get there. And people say, well, people are interested, they haven't turned up. So, well, they are interested, but it's inaccessible. Um, so that's, that's the only thing I'd say about that. Thank you. Um, because I was determined to finish my session on time and it's uh, we still have got the exciting results of the poll to share as to what the conference's favourite smell is. I just want to use this moment to say a massive thank you to everybody who's given their time today to come talk to us, to share their insights. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed being here and it's great connecting with people and hearing your ideas and tips. And I think we have to keep going and doing what we're doing. Um, I'm with the with Anna. It's like over the last 10 years, the last 15 years, this has really begun to grow and get some movement and some momentum. And it's a really exciting movement to be part of. So thank you, everybody. Um, Marissa, go on then, do the magic. Share of the screen of who won on the poll. Oh, it's close. Um, I think I can say it's a garden on an early morning in spring. <laughs> Enjoy, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs>